Professor Cantor, you just released a very timely book called Move, Putting America's Infrastructure Back in the Lead. What's the central thesis of Move? Is that we'd better get moving. Our infrastructure is deteriorating. Our transportation is not as good as it should be. We're stuck in traffic. We're stuck in congressional gridlock. We're stuck in assumptions that are obsolete because of change. And this affects all of us. It affects business people, both in their own commutes and as employers. It affects them if they're trying to get goods shipped across the country or out of a port. It affects families. It's a big part of the family budget. It affects whether kids can get out of poor neighborhoods into better schools. It affects the environment. It's a huge source transportation, a huge source of pollution. It affects health, it affects safety, it affects everything. Why have we seemed to have gotten so stuck on route to the future here in the United States? We made a lot of big investments in the U.S. after World War II. Mm -hmm. Investments in highways, interstate highways, 41,000 miles, $25 billion initial investment, which was a lot for the 1950s. We then invested in technology for aviation in the 1960s because of the space race and Sputnik. Mm -hmm. It was all defense related. It was also the time when we were on top of the world. Mm -hmm. We had been the victors in the war. Our economy grew because of these investments, but then, you know, it's easy to become complacent. It's easy to stop investing. It's easy to assume that how we thought about it then was all about defense will continue to last. So, our infra so it's now aging, our infrastructure is aging. And we neglected, because of highways, we, we neglected rail. So many components of our rail infrastructure in the U.S. are over 100 years old, not even dating to the 1950s. They date to the 19th century. Wow. How can we actually learn from our infrastructure failures? We better learn. I mean, <laughs> learning is the name of what this site is all about. We would better learn. I mean, our failures, though, are a failure to reinvest. And there we can learn several things about change that are, in, that are parts of the lessons that I teach companies, I teach individuals, mm. I teach students. One is that maintenance is not a vision. You can't ah. get people rallied behind let's repair something that's broken. There's, that's true. <laughs> there's a human tendency to want to abandon it right. rather than fix it. So maintenance isn't a vision. We're not going to get people to support investment just because it's broken. Mm -hmm. um, we need a bigger vision. So that's a lesson about, universal lesson about leadership. Also, it's not a vision to talk about immediate benefits without thinking about what's a long-term strategy. So maintenance isn't a vision, repair isn't enough. I talk about three R's in MOVE. We need to repair, renew, and reinvent. And you know, that would be a good lesson for corporate strategy too, that you don't just fix. Every time you fix, you try to improve, and you also try to dramatically reinvent it. So the hopeful sign is actually technology, the smartphone, wireless networks may help us reinvent transportation in particular. Wow, how is, how is that? Well, we already see that the smartphone is meeting the smart road. Roads with sensors now can provide data over wireless networks to manage traffic. We can use our smartphones, which are really not that many years old. This is a 21st century innovation that can help us leap into a new system. So our smartphone can be used to summon, to get, to find a shared car so you don't have to own a car. Mm -hmm. You can get a ride, you can find out where it is, you can unlock it, jump in, and there you are. We can use it to summon a ride. So new business models, Uber and Lyft, mm -hmm. we can use it to find parking. And it turns out, while I say in the book that parking apps are not gonna change the world, <laughs> The fact is they might because a large amount of the congestion we face in cities, which is a huge sore spot for entrepreneurs and business leaders who mm -hmm. can't get around, 
a lot of the congestion is for people from people driving around looking for parking. Mm -hmm. And if they could easily match car to space, assuming they still have a car, then that will reduce traffic. And so there's lots of ways, and we're only at the beginning of learning this. I happen to really love an app that was developed by the city of Boston, so by a city <laughs> government with entrepreneurs. Oh. It's called Street Bump. And that app, if, can, if your car is connected, it detects potholes from the vibrations Amazing. of the car. That sensors. Amazing. So you don't even have to call it in. Your car is telling the city transportation department that they'd better come and fix those paddles. Intelligence. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> well, that, it's also learning. I mean, the machines are yeah. going to be learning for us in some wow. ways. In the book, you say that this infrastructure issue that affects businesses and corporations um, needs a human face to it. Why is it so important to approach problems from the perspective of the user? We definitely should be approaching every problem from a user perspective. I mean, anything. You make a product, you have to know what need of the customer it's really serving. It can't just be because you have a groovy product. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that somebody wants it and it will enhance their lives. So here we have an area that we've tried to scare people into supporting. You know, a bridge collapses, some people are killed in Minnesota, why don't we invest? Amtrak has a derailment, there have been other crashes. Mm -hmm. That's supposed to scare people, but people don't embrace the future because of fear. Mm -hmm. They embrace the future because of a vision, and that vision connects with something they need in their lives, in their business, in their family. And so, I, it's not that I tell a thousand stories of individuals suffering in traffic jams, but everyone gets it immediately. Yeah. So if you write about what the human consequences are, and also I'm a leadership expert and I'm somebody who really cares about the human side of business, if you think about what the consequences are for people, you're much more likely to get support for the issue and likely to be more relevant in mm -hmm. setting priorities for something that's also hard to get people to think about because it seems so big and expensive mm -hmm. at a time when people don't like big and they don't like expensive. What does MOVE tell us about innovation, its challenges and its importance? So one of the ways we will bring America's infrastructure into the 21st century and then not only catch up with countries like Singapore infrastructure in China, Japan, some European countries. But we could leap ahead in part because of the huge strength the United States has in innovation and entrepreneurship. Because this is all about innovation. For every problem, there could be an innovative solution. Since I've been out on my book tour, I'm getting emails from people who have new ways of detecting whether a bridge is vulnerable to collapse underneath the water. I have people who are telling me about a new material that's lighter, that can be used on roads. We have so many traditional assumptions mm -hmm. about how things need to be that if we think differently, I mean, that's in fact what ride-sharing services like Uber and Lyft, and Uber has been recently valued at $50 billion. Mm. That's a huge valuation for something that also has rubbed many stakeholders the wrong way, but clearly users really want it. Love and it. that's an innovation. So in for nearly every one of these problems, there's likely to be an innovation and sometimes a simple solution to something that otherwise would be truly expensive to take care of, we could do cheaply. Um, I think apps, I mean, I'm, I'm very enamored of what you can do now with wireless networks and with your device, a smartphone. Um, things we wouldn't have dreamed of. What makes a great leader? And what differentiates leadership for large scale change like you're talking about in MOVE? So leaders, I mean, I, I've, leaders do guide innovation and I do have a lot of lessons in MOVE about how that happens. I mean, you need courage. You need to see things differently. You need to assume 
that it doesn't have to be this way. Mm. And so I always associate innovation with leaders, not necessarily the details of creating new technology or a new product, because leaders do have the foresight to think ahead mm -hmm. and to think about what could improve upon our current situation. So here we have a big problem, and yet I keep saying it doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to accept the status quo. Great leaders don't accept the status quo. They're, con they're not simply protecting their turf, protecting their territory. In fact, I mean, sometimes they are. We know we're all human. <laughs> but they are looking for that something better than what exists. And they're often driven by that sense of purpose. Now, I talk about this kind of leadership within companies, within startups, within organizations of any kind, hospitals, nonprofits. Um, a big messy problem, like education or like the transportation system in America, which I'm writing about now, big messy problems are very difficult for traditional leadership theories to tell us how to solve. They're big messy problems in which no one organization controls the whole thing. I mean, the auto industry doesn't control the roads, right. and they're kind of controlling the cars, but now Google may be controlling the cars, <laughs> actually. So you don't control all the factors. It's too broad, it's too big. There's no agreement on goals. So there are people battling all the time. Should we do this? Should we do that? Where should we invest? It's a problem where there are multiple stakeholders, many different interest groups, and they don't agree. So this is an even bigger kind of leadership. I call it advanced leadership. It's leadership that can tackle something where you don't control over all the factors and yet you know how to rally people behind a sense of purpose and a vision, and you know how to try to bring as many stakeholders to the table as you can. Why is it important that all the players that you've mentioned that affect the infrastructure and the problems that you address and move, why do they need to be lifelong learners? Well, first of all, everybody who's engaged in change has to have the capacity to learn because otherwise you are stuck in the past. Otherwise you are stuck in past assumptions. And um, then we never get change. Mm -hmm. Change is opening minds to new possibilities. That's what learning is. It's incorporating new knowledge and it's helping us embrace a better future. When you talk about all the stakeholders in MOVE, what do you see as the pathway to creating learning organizations um, in these contexts, uh, you know, you're talking about the government, you're talking about corporations, the car builders, the roadway construction companies, the, is there a way to promote um, learning for everyone involved? Well, first of all, I think you have to convene the conversation. If you don't have mm -hmm. the conversation with everybody at the table hearing the same message, Again, you don't get change, you don't open minds. So the best leaders, the best CEOs I know, invite conversations. They bring people together. They provide facts and knowledge, but they also provide opportunities for dialogue and exchange with people who might not always agree. And that's called learning. Learning is, is I sometimes tweet one of my favorite sayings, the most radical thing we can do is introduce people to one another because then you get different viewpoints and people are open to change. That's called learning. So that's what they do. And then you need two things in that conversation. Of course, the facts, the evidence only go so far. It's very easy for people to deny facts. If you, mm. so, but you need to repeat the facts over and over again. If you repeat them long enough and you start bringing about conversions of points of view, then that's fine to just have the facts. But you also need a sense of purpose. You also need a mission larger than yourself, larger than the other people mm -hmm. at the table. You have to call on people's better selves as well as their brains to absorb new knowledge, and then you can get change.